Back in the 1990s, geologists dated a late Homo erectus site known as Ngandong on the Solo River in Java, Indonesia, to around 27,000 years ago. This young date sent shockwaves through the paleontological community. However, a follow-up study redated the late Homo erectus site to around 120,000 years. Still young, but not that young. Now, a groundbreaking new study has dated two other late Homo erectus sites at Trinil and Sambung Makan on Java to between 40,000 and 70,000 years, a shocking story which has not been widely discussed. These young dates suggest that these were not late Homo erectus at all, but likely represent the elusive southern branch of the Denisovans. In fact, the quest to identify the elusive southern Denisovans now has a striking genetic revelation. A new analysis of Denisovan DNA in Papuan and island Southeast Asian peoples has overturned the older, simpler idea of a single Denisovan lineage. Until now, all we really had was a finger bone and a few teeth from the chilly Denisova cave in the Altai Mountains of Siberia. Those remains yielded a genome that told us Denisovans were a sister group to Neanderthals, splitting from them roughly 400,000 years ago. For a decade, the field tended to assume that any Denisovan ancestry in modern humans came from populations closely related to that Siberian individual. But the recent work on Papuans made clear that this was wrong. The genomes of Papuans and nearby islanders held not one but two deeply divergent Denisovan signals, and one of them, which they called D2, was as different from the Altai Denisovan as Neanderthals are from us. The northern and southern lineages of Denisovans had been separated for so long, about 360,000 years, that if we could see them alive today, we would likely classify them as distinct human species, or at least as dramatically different populations, with striking anatomical contrasts. The second Denisovan signal, D1, also found in Papuans, but more closely related to the Altai specimen, split off later, around 280,000 years ago. These time depths are of the same order as the split between Neanderthals and modern humans, which is why the study emphasized how far apart the Denisovan branches really are. The southern Denisovan population had been isolated long enough to accumulate its own suite of traits. We know only indirectly what they looked like, but if life on tropical islands tends to drive smaller body size, lighter skeletons, and subtler brow ridges, what biologists call insular dwarfing and gracilization, then it is reasonable to suspect that the southern Denisovans were more lightly built than their northern kin, who occupied colder continental climates. These genetic findings immediately forced anthropologists to ask what fossil record could belong to this mysterious southern branch. For decades, Java has yielded an enigmatic set of late archaic human skulls and limb bones that have never fit neatly into the story of Homo erectus. It is here, along the Solo River, at sites like Ngandong and Sambung Makan, that we may finally have the bones of the southern Denisovans hiding in plain sight. The story of those fossils begins in the Dutch East Indies during the early 20th century. Eugene Dubois's discovery of Java Man at Trinil in 1891 had already electrified the world by showing that archaic humans roamed Southeast Asia long before modern humans were supposed to have arrived. Dubois's fossils, assigned to Homo erectus, were robust skullcaps with heavy brows and long, low cranial vaults. But in the 1930s, Dutch geologists returned to the Solo River and about 10 kilometers from Trinil uncovered something different at Ngandong. Twelve skullcaps and two tibiae embedded in river terrace sediments. The two tibia, labeled Trinil 9 and 10, have now been redated to 40,000 years old igniting new interest in these fossils. What's more, new dating using the Sambung Makan Krania reveal a minimum age of 40,000 and a maximum of 60,000 to 70,000 years. These bones were similar to Java Man, but subtly more modern. A bit higher cranial vaults, slightly reduced brow ridges, and hints of a lighter build. They were initially given the name Homo soloensis, though most later workers subsumed them back into Homo erectus as a late, perhaps transitional, form. From the start, dating Ngandong was a nightmare. 
Some geologists believe the remains were as young as 27,000 years, suggesting shocking coexistence with Homo sapiens. Others argued for ages, hundreds of thousands of years older. Bones of water buffalo and other animals complicated things, as river action could mix fossils from different layers. Geologists used new radiometric methods and announced dates as young as 53,000 to 27,000 years, a result so startling that geologists wondered if they had made a mistake. If correct, it would have meant late surviving Erectus met modern humans in Java. Multi-regionalists, who argued for continuous evolution from Erectus to modern Asians, saw this as support, while out-of-Africa proponents suggested the young dates simply showed modern humans replacing an archaic population that had hung on surprisingly late. But follow-up fieldwork brought caution. Archaeologists returned to Ngandong and decided to date the river terraces themselves rather than just bones. They mapped ancient floodplain steps, used dozens of age estimates from sediments and volcanic layers, and built a Bayesian model of site formation. Their analysis showed that the fossil-bearing terrace formed between about 117,000 and 108,000 years ago. That result swept away the young 27,000 to 40,000-year estimates as products of reworked or intrusive material and showed that Ngandong humans lived during the last part of the Middle Pleistocene before modern humans reached Java. It also ruled out a direct meeting between Ngandong hominins and Homo sapiens, but left open the question of interactions with other archaics, such as Denisovans. Nearby Sambung Makan, another Solo River locality, has yielded additional skull caps with similar anatomy. These have been less securely dated, but their morphology resembles Ngandong, long low vaults, but with a more vertical forehead, slightly larger brains and generally more gracile construction than classic early Javan erectors from Sangiran or Trinil. The Sambung Makan fossils, like Ngandong, have sparked endless debate about whether they represent a late-surviving Homo erectus population, a hybrid horde influenced by modern human or other archaic gene flow, or a distinct taxon altogether. When we combine these puzzling Javan fossils with the new genetic picture, an intriguing hypothesis emerges. The southern Denisovan lineage, identified in Papuan genomes, diverged from the Siberian Denisovan almost 360,000 years ago, long before the Nangandong population's time. If that lineage had moved south into Wallacea and Java during low sea stands of the Middle Pleistocene, when the Sunda Shelf was dry and water gaps to Wallacea were narrower, it could have become isolated and evolved separately. Tropical forest expansion and fluctuating sea levels repeatedly fragmented habitats in the region, creating the conditions for long-term separation. By the time of the last interglacial and the subsequent glacial pulse around 100,000 years ago, this southern Denisovan group could have occupied Java and neighboring islands, adapting to open woodlands and riverine plains. Ngandong's environment fits this idea. Paleoecology shows it was cooler and more open than present-day Java, with elephants, tigers, water buffalo tapirs, and even hippopotamuses. The toolkit, simple flakes, choppers, bone spears and daggers, bowlers and hammer stones of andesite, was less sophisticated than the blade-rich industries of later Homo sapiens, but beyond what early Homo erectus is usually credited with. Pathology on some skulls shows healed injuries and perhaps interpersonal violence. Some researchers long suggested ritual headhunting. Others attribute the breakage to river transport and volcanic events. Either way, we see a small, resilient, somewhat more lightly built hominin population eking out a living in a dynamic tropical setting. Genetics tells us that modern humans met a D2 Denisovan population east of the Wallace line around 46,000 years ago. That means D2, or its descendants, survived somewhere in island Southeast Asia until then. The Ngandong fossils at 117,000 to 108,000 years prove that such a lineage could persist late in Java. Even if the particular Solo River group vanished before Sapiens arrived, its relatives could have hung on farther east in the Moluccas or New Guinea highlands, where sea levels periodically linked islands into stepping stones. The later D1 Denisovan signal in Papuans, which entered their ancestry around 30,000 years ago 
and seems confined to mainland New Guinea, could represent a relict southern Denisovan group surviving in the rugged interior long after Java's populations disappeared. Who knows? Maybe they even had red hair like orangutans, or blue eyes like some species of monkey. One compelling feature of the genetic work is that the divergence between D2 and the Altai Denisovan is on the same scale as that between us and Neanderthals. This implies that if we could compare skeletons, we would see major differences. The Altai Denisovan's remains suggest a robust body, heavy jaw, and large molars, suited to cold and continental living. In contrast, a southern population isolated on islands for hundreds of millennia could trend towards smaller body size, reduced brow ridges, and generally gracile features. Southern Denisovan skeletons could show tropical island adaptations, slender limbs for heat dissipation, less massive skulls, perhaps even smaller stature. The Nungandong and Sambung Makan skulls, though not tiny, are indeed more lightly built than early Javan erectus, and have larger brain cases, traits that might reflect a long, insular evolution under different ecological pressures. The sea level record supports the possibility of such isolation. Around 360,000 years ago, when D2 first split, the world was entering a glacial period with low seas. The Sunda Shelf was exposed, linking mainland Southeast Asia to Sumatra, Borneo and Java, but the Wallace Line Islands remained separated by narrow straits. Even a few tens of kilometres of water could keep populations apart, but allow occasional crossings. As climates oscillated, forests and savannas shifted, and lineages could easily be marooned on particular island chains. By 283,000 years ago, when D1 branched off, glacial conditions again lowered seas, but repeated interglacials then raised them, fragmenting ranges. These pulses would have fostered long-term isolation of groups like D2 and D1. By the time Homo sapiens expanded out of Africa and along the southern coastal route into Southeast Asia about 60,000 to 50,000 years ago, they encountered at least one of these island populations. The D2 admixture event, dated to roughly 46,000 years ago, shows contact somewhere east of Wallace's line, perhaps the Moluccas or western New Guinea, where a southern Denisovan remnant survived. Later, a more localised D1 group, apparently confined to New Guinea's rugged mainland, had mixed again with Papuans around 30,000 years ago. These genetic events mirror the fossil hints, an early widespread insular archaic that gradually retreated and fragmented, leaving relic pockets in the most remote and rugged refugia. The Nungandong discovery's long, tangled history illustrates how hard it is to match genes to bones. Early 20th century scientists saw the Solo River skulls as intermediate between apes and humans. Mid-century thinkers speculated about ritual skull use and mysterious extinction. Late 20th century geochronologists produced startlingly young ages, fueling dramatic but premature scenarios of contact with sapiens. Only with the new terrace dating work do we have a secure timeline. These were late survivors of an erectus-grade population living in Java until just over 100,000 years ago, not contemporaries of incoming modern humans, but plausible members of a southern Denisovan clade long separate from the Siberian branch. Linking them explicitly to Denisovans will require DNA, but that is not impossible. Ancient DNA preservation in tropics is poor, but recent proteomic and sediment DNA breakthroughs have recovered molecular traces even from warm regions. If peptides or environmental DNA could be pulled from Ngandong or Sambung Makan sediments, we might finally tie the southern Denisovan genome to a face. For now, the morphological and chronological match is tantalizing. A more gracile, insular, late-middle Pleistocene population in the exact region where genetics says an ancient Denisovan branch was waiting for modern humans. Thinking about the southern Denisovans also reshapes our image of human diversity. For years, the focus has been on cold-adapted Neanderthals and Denisovans of Siberia. But Southeast Asia's deep islands may have hosted their own long-lasting inventive humans. These people were not simply archaic holdovers doomed to vanish. They were survivors, experimenting with tools, adapting to volcanic landscapes and dynamic forests, persisting for hundreds of millennia. 
Their long isolation, greater than the gulf between us and Neanderthals, means they likely looked and behaved in ways quite unlike either modern humans or northern Denisovans. Identifying the southern Denisovans would also explain puzzling features of Southeast Asian prehistory. It might clarify why some modern populations carry large Denisovan genomic contributions with immune and metabolic adaptations useful in tropical climates. It might illuminate the mysterious hand axes, bone tools and ornaments scattered across the region, and the apparent cultural fluorescence of islanders long before sapiens arrived. It could even shed light on how modern humans moved so fast into Sahul, perhaps aided or hindered by encounters with these insular cousins. The recognition that Denisovans were not one monolithic group but a web of long separated lineages parallels what we have learned about modern humans themselves. Diversity, isolation and repeated contact shaped everyone's story. The southern Denisovans were not a side note, they were a major independent experiment in being human in the islands of Southeast Asia. Their ghosts live on in Papuan DNA, in the shape of skull caps dug from solo river terraces, and perhaps in the adaptive traits of modern islanders. The new genetic framework allows us to see them for the first time and to reinterpret fossils once shoehorned into a simple erectus category. Future discoveries may add detail, a better resolved timeline of when D2 and D1 spread south, proteomic confirmation of Denisovan affinity in Gandong or Sambung Makan, and refined climate sea level models showing how glacial pulses opened and closed routes across the Sunda and Sahul shelves. For now, though, a compelling narrative is in place. Around 360,000 years ago, an archaic human population split from the northern Denisovans of continental Asia. This southern branch spread into the tropical archipelago, adapting and surviving through dramatic environmental swings. One part of it evolved into the Ngandong Sambong Makan people of Java, robust yet more gracile than their ancestors, skilled enough to thrive in a challenging landscape, but doomed as rainforests reclaimed their open woodlands. Another part pressed farther east, lingering in the islands that would become New Guinea. How did the Denisovans, or late Homo erectus, get to Papua? Water dispersal by Homo erectus is accidental. There's no manifest destiny, there's no plot, said Russell Chioshon, a paleoanthropologist at the University of Iowa at Iowa City, in an article in National Geographic. When modern humans swept along the coast tens of millennia ago, they met and mixed with these southern Denisovans, first around 46,000 years ago, and then again with a more localized New Guinean remnant, around 30,000 years ago. The long-buried skull caps of Solo Man and the quiet signatures in Papuan genomes are two halves of one story. Genetics reveals a southern Denisovan people as different from Siberian Denisovans as we are from Neanderthals. Fossils from Java show an insular, late archaic humanity that fits that genetic ghost. The pieces finally begin to align, giving us our first clear picture of a lost population that shaped modern humans even as it faded into prehistory. Thank you for watching and please click on these other videos to learn more.